Hello and welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. Today's date is Friday, May 10th, 2024. My guest today is Zenzo Tazawa. Zenzo is the Director of Company Culture and Teams for Aquarium Co-op. And Zenzo has a diverse background in our hobby, from breeding African cichlids to running his own aquarium service business. Zenzo's YouTube channel, Tazawa Tanks, recently achieved the milestone of 100,000 subscribers. So Zenzo, welcome and congratulations. Thanks, Randy. Great to be on the show again and uh, appreciate the uh, recognition of the channel hitting that milestone. It took a long time and uh, it was a long, long journey, but uh, feels good to be there. Yeah, absolutely. I don't ever really like to talk too much of like behind the scenes, youtube kind of stuff. But when you started your channel, did you because I feel like some people are like, yeah, man, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to hit 100,000 subs. They have a whole roadmap. And then other people are just like, nah, I just did it to start talking about fish stuff. Like, where, where were you, did you have aspirations of 100,000 subs? Uh, not initially. So it was kind of an evolution. So when I first started making videos, it was just because I wanted to talk about my own personal experience with some of my tanks and nothing special. It was like a iPhone 6 or something like that and edited on my phone with like the iOS uh, iMovie app. And uh, basically just kind of did that for a while and ended up meeting Corey McElroy, our, our uh, founder of Aquarium Co-op. Met him in 2017 and uh, he kind of gave me a few pointers on, you know, what he thought people should do to grow the channel. So I went home and did everything that he said and, and quickly grew my channel. And, uh, it, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where like, oh, I got another 300 subscribers. I'm at 2,000 and... Um, because when I met him, I had 111, and uh, I got to a thousand within like four or five months, and then uh, I think about a year later, I was at 10,000, and as at, it was at that point when I thought like, oh, like this is a real thing, I can start to you know really focus on doing a better job. So I bought a camera, I bought a MacBook so I could edit on a computer. Unfortunately, you, of, bought a, you bought a Canon, didn't you? I bought I love Canon, so I bought a Canon. <laughs> Uh, one, one of my first and many. And um, and then, yeah, I, I just kind of continued on. And, and I think it was in 2019 when I made some videos about mudskippers that went like semi-viral. And that's when I realized like, oh, like people are actually like, this is reaching a larger audience. It's getting a lot of views. And that's when I really started to think about, you know, getting to 100K. And at the time, I was like, oh, I could like, this could be like a real side hustle and, you know, replace some income at my other job when I was where I was working before. Um, but then the YouTube world changed and it became much more difficult to grow a channel, to gain subscribers, to um, earn income and revenue. Um, and that's continuing on. Like there are countless channels across the YouTube platform that are having challenges. And it's just, you know, it's just the evolution of social media and how people consume content. And um, so getting to finally get to 100K felt great. And, you know, have that plaque on my wall. So it was something that I, I'll always just mm -hmm. have there and, and, uh, well, what was really what was really awesome too was that, and and please don't, I, I I think you know this, but I want the audience to know I'm not trying to overshadow Zenzo's amazing accomplishment, but it, you, we got to celebrate it at the same time with the co-op main channel hitting a million subscribers. So like we had this like dual celebration of mm -hmm. you know your channel, your personal channel, and the co-op channel. Like that just felt really awesome. Like man, we we got to celebrate like two channels hitting amazing milestones. That was yeah. a super. That was super cool. Yeah, it was very cool, and it, it was it was funny that we hit those milestones around the same time because I was always tracking at about ten percent of where Aquarium Co-op was. So if Aquarium Co-op was at eight hundred thousand subscribers, I was at eighty. If it was at a hundred thousand, I was at ten. And so it was just kind of a barometer for me to always like, oh, like you know, we're both getting there. And of course, obviously, Corey and I talk about YouTube and and share pointers and that kind of a thing. But um, I, I will say that this last like the last 10,000 was the most difficult and it took the longest um, as, you know, Corey would attest to with uh, our channel getting to a million um, as, you know, people started watching short form content. And, and what happened is YouTube 
is uh, has been and still is focused on pushing short form content and a lot of the longer form content that we've all been accustomed to um, kind of gets pushed down and so it doesn't get uh, shared with as many people it's not as much eyeballs there's less emphasis on subscribing now so um, but yeah I made it I feel great I'm happy and uh, just uh, you know on other things now yeah no that's super awesome man and a um, couple things I want to unpack there and kind of dive into deeper. When, where were you when the first time you met Corndog and you guys were talking about um, your channel and he gave you those pointers? Yeah, so uh, so prior to joining uh, Crime Co-op, I worked for a distribution company in, in the food service industry. And uh, my job had me traveling all over the country. So I was, when I say all over, I was like 100 flights a year, um, three we weeks a month a, I was... we have another milestone that just reminded me of your oh, other yes. personal milestone I, I i'm sorry milestone. i'm sorry to i'm yes. sorry to interrupt zenzo <laughs> so so uh so i would travel quite extensively all over the country and um obviously i was into fish keeping and i was up in the seattle area on business and thought like oh like i'm gonna go check out the store aquarium co-op so i went there and made the journey and it just so happened that Corey was there this was at the time when he was already stepping back from being there every day and was kind of uh, working from home a lot and uh, he just happened to be in there i remember him talking about tacos during his live stream so i showed up with like these taco time gift cards i'm like hey i brought you some gift cards for taco time he thought that was cool and i introduced myself told him that i uh um, had a service business and had a YouTube channel. And Corey didn't know because he told me years later that he didn't know I was such a small channel. He thought that I had like thousands of subscribers already. <laughs> so he didn't realize I was like, I had nothing. So maybe it was the way that I portrayed myself. I, I was probably wearing a suit when I came in. So I looked very professional, obviously. Um, so uh, yeah, so that was 2017 uh, in the springtime. I want to say it was like March or April or right around there. Um if I went back in my Instagram, I think I even took like a, I don't know, I have a some kind of picture that that uh, captures that milestone time. And um, and then he came down to speak at the San Francisco Crime Society, and he gave a talk on puffers, I believe, and that was uh, the summer of 2017. And then at that time, he came over, filmed like made like a little video in my fish room uh, downstairs, and uh, just from there we just you know started kind of a friendship and would chat every now and there now and then and uh um yeah so he'd, he's been over you know a few times and and then when did the real, there. when did your real fish talk episode when did uh when did that happen in the timeline uh i don't remember i want to say that was 20... the first time that was the first time that i saw you was it was on real fish talk and so that like, would have been i think were like, 2018 probably were 2018 were you the first guest on Real Fish Talk? No, no, no. It, it, no? it was they had already done like thirty something or whatever. I think at really that time. at so, that point, I believe so. Oh, or yeah, I wasn't the first one. It was a couple dozen in, but okay. Um, I believe that would have been maybe later in 2018, possibly. I forgot when it was in that time frame. Yeah, because yeah. I joined. I joined like Thanksgiving of 2018 is when I joined the coop. Okay. Yeah. We'll we'll have to go back and, and and find the date. I'm sure if we we could pause and look it up. But uh Well um while I'm not the most consistent, you and I did ju- and we we do still need to talk about your personal milestone, by the way, of airline travel. Oh sure. Um yes. that the Aquarius podcast, the first episode was February two thousand eighteen. Mm-hmm. So six years ago. Yeah. Which I time. have not been the most consistent uploader, but that's uh that's pretty wild. I actually showed one of my neighbors um I wanted to show him my the angelfish that I worked with because he is actually from the Bay Area, California, and he was a mm-hmm. member of the Bay Area Cichlid Club out there. And so we were just kind of nerding out on fish stuff. And so I pulled up, I, I only put out what, like four actual videos on my YouTube channel. It's all just podcast uploads for people to listen to. Um, and I showed him the video where I was talking about mailing angelfish and I used like a kind of a talking head video, but I had the angelfish feeding it on an ONIP tab up in the top mm-hmm. corner to like keep people's attention. At least I thought that right. would, which again, I'm not a video editor or a professional content creator. Uh-huh. Um, and so I went, cause I, he was like, man, those angelfish are beautiful. But then I looked at me and I was like, oh my God, why do I look so young? <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's cause it was like six years ago. Six and years ago. You're an old man now. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, time uh, 
Time is uh, chasing all of us. So yeah, the personal milestone, I'm actually holding this little million mile coin. Um, so uh, recently I passed a million miles on United Airlines uh, as I was flying exclusively with them during my uh, last job and continue to do so. And um, uh, it's not like a million miles, like earning miles, like credit card purchases and all that kind of stuff. It's actual literal flown miles. So if you fly from here to Portland and it's 600 and something miles or whatever it is, that's what it's counting. So if you think about a million miles, they actually sent me like this little plaque and it like talks about like how far a million miles actually is. And um, it's kind of funny, but uh, I just kind of keep it here on my shelf. Well, Sorry what was if I'm my, messing up the audio. But. No, no, you're good. What my hokey estimation was basically the average speed of like a Boeing 737 is X number of miles per hour. And so I said, okay, that divided by a million. Basically, you spent 80 days, like 80 consecutive days flying 24 hours a day nonstop is what it takes to get to a million miles at an average speed that a Boeing 737 flies at. But I'm sure you're on some Bombardier propeller planes. I'm sure you're on some slower Embraer jets. Like, yes. you know, you weren't always boogieing at whatever, 600 miles an hour or whatever it was. But uh, a million miles, dude. Amazing. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a lot of miles, it's a lot of time, and a lot of time away from home, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and, it, and that's not great. It's one of those bittersweet things where it was, it yeah. was a... Um, it was something that I was wanting to achieve, like the 100,000 subscriber thing on YouTube. Um, but uh, it also means like, you know, you miss performances and, yeah. and, and school things. And, you know, I'm like, oh, do you remember this this thing at the school? Like, no, I was on a business trip that week. I didn't I didn't get to see that play or whatever it was. So there's all those kind of things that you can never get back and you miss those. And then. So yeah, it's it's but then at the same time it's like now I have lifetime status. My wife has lifetime status now, so um you know where all nice... the good bathrooms are in all the major airports. Like you know all the airport tricks. I have a lot of airport <laughs> traveling tricks, rental car, hotel tricks, yes. So uh yeah, I'm definitely a road warrior. If you ever seen the movie Up in the Air with George Clooney, that is the perfect analogy of what it's like being a road warrior. It's mm. they really did a good job with depicting what it's like to be living out of a suitcase. Mm. I have not seen that yet, but now you have inspired me to mm -hmm. look that one up. I would say I'd run down a blockbuster, but you know, can't really do that anymore. All right, Zenzo, um, we did not pay any bills in the beginning. So this episode of the Aquarius podcast, as people know, is sponsored by none other than aquarium co-op in Zenzo. Um, we both have a highly biased opinion on the amazingness that is Aquarium Co-op as employees, but what product or two, one's fine, what would you like to highlight on today's episode for the good folks out there uh, to uh, run to AquariumCoop.com or their local uh, retail partner program store and pick up? You know, yes, obviously I'm biased because we have a lot of great products and people ask this of me all the time um, and it really depends on what people are doing with their fish there are two for me there's 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 three products um and i'll just go quickly up over them the first product is our sponge filtration system with the easy flow up uh easy flow kit and i think i've always loved sponge filters having a fish room it's the only filtration that makes sense for me the coarse sponges are infinitely better as far as um how to you know keeping them clean and all that kind of stuff and then the easy flow kits just just stepped it up to another level as far as the flow and that kind of a thing paired with the air collar um easy green so for anyone who has plants like you don't even have to be that good at keeping plants. If you have a decent light and throw in some easy green, you're going to have some healthy plants. So that's been really helpful for me. Um, but the one that I've been really loving, especially lately, because I've been doing a lot of it, is our live baby brine shrimp eggs. Um, so I have the cis hatchery that we sell, and I have that mounted in my fish room. And anytime that I'm home for more than two days in a row, I'm hatching brine shrimp. And it's just, uh, it's a food that... Fry will eat, obviously, small fish will eat, but even like my cichlids that are up to about three inches, they go crazy for it. So I just hatch it every day and um, 
for me, it's just been, it's, it's great. Like, and I have lots of fish foods and, you know, full disclosure, I don't pay for fish food, so I can pretty much use any fish food I want, but I always like to reach for that brine shrimp and, and hatch it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Dustin Ward also, his episode came out this week and he also, that was what he recommended. It, I just got this feeling of, as you talked about feeding it out to fry of the, if you ever want to have a proud parent moment, watching your newly, like newly birthed hatched fry eat baby brine shrimp and get those big fat like orangey red bellies that is such a proud parent moment you're just like yes this is amazing i i love i love feeding baby brine shrimp it is um like ultra nutritious but also you get the experience of watching your fish go absolutely bananas And it is a feeding frenzy and you get to pretend that you're Dr. Evil and you've got a bunch of sharks and you're feeding them, (laughs) you know, what, like whatever you want, right? Like you're just watching this little fish feeding frenzy. It's phenomenal. Yeah, it's definitely a fish feeding, feeding frenzy, kind of like what you would imagine, you know, larger predatory fish going after, you know, bait fish in the ocean, Mm -hmm. those, you know, giant balls of bait fish. But, uh, you know, it's nutrient dense. Um, It's easy to digest. Uh, you know, I believe that the construction of the of the, the brine shrimp itself it aids in the d- digestive system, and then also it pr- it provides um, activity for the fish. Right? It's it's uh, I don't want to view want to call it light, life enriching, but they're chasing food and, and they're not having to like hunt it and chase it, but it's still, you know, the, the brine shrimp are still like swimming around in the water and they still have to, you know, go and grab it. So, um, yeah, it's enjoyable to, to see well, full bellies. Like I've, I've, you know, in my role at the Quorum Culp, I've gone down the, you know, the more industrial side of our hobby and, uh, looking at manufacturers and, um, where a lot of the, you know, our hobby, we just kind of piggyback actually on what like aquaculture does and baby brine shrimp and uh, brine shrimp are an incredibly important part of aquaculture. So outside of us just raising fish for the hobby, um, actual like food fish, that is a very important part of raising fry. Um, so very important to that as well. So awesome, man. Thank you, Zenzo. Uh, back to the regularly scheduled podcast. Thank you very much, Aquarium Co-op for sponsoring this episode. Uh, Zenzo, what, what's going on in your fish room? Uh, so my pit, my fish room is, um, I would say it's going in a, it's in transition. So, um, I have a wonderful fish room. Uh, Corey and Dean came down here in 2020, early 2020, and, uh, we did a full renovation on it. So it's aesthetically pleasing. It's very quiet down there with the sound panels. It's efficient. Um, it's a wonderful fish room. And I, I enjoyed it thoroughly, especially during the COVID years when, you know, we weren't doing a whole lot outside of the home, especially here in California. Um, I would say over the past year or so, I've maybe not spent as much attention in the fish room as I would like to. And, and I've neglected some things and I don't want to call it burnout because I feel like uh, I still very much enjoy the hobby and I'm very passionate about the hobby, but um I I basically realized that I need to spend more time in the fish room to enjoy the fish again. So um, I have a little desk down there that I can work at from time to time. Um, and so right now what I'm doing is I'm focusing on fish that I want to keep and that, I, that I'm happy with and the tanks that I enjoy. And if there's something down there, it's like the whole Maria Con- Condo thing. If there's something that's not bringing me joy... I'm making a change. So I'm either going to give the fish away, um, take the tank down and just have things that I enjoy. And one thing that I noticed today is the tanks that are at eye level tend to get a lot more attention from me than tanks that are lower than, than eye level. So whether that's standing or sitting, if it's, I have tanks that are, you know, in a fish room, you're going to have low tanks and high tanks and tanks that are lower. um, I've noticed kind of, don't get as much attention. So I'm going to kind of focus on moving some fish around. What I also realize is I do love African cichlids. And every time I talk about fish and what fish I want to keep, like I always gravitate back towards them, whether they're Malawi fish or Tanganyikan fish. And so I have a um, two aquariums in my living room. And I've realized that uh, they've been neglected. I did a water change yesterday, but they've been neglected. And... I think part of the reason is the fish that are in there aren't particularly exciting to me. So I'm going to move those around, give some away, move some down to the fish room um, and put some, 
put Malawis back in my living room tank. So I've got that colorful, vibrant aquarium activity going on again. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of where I am with my fish room, and um, I don't I don't see myself uh, making any drastic changes down there just because it looks so nice and it's it's I don't want to mess up the aesthetic quality. And a lot of people on YouTube they comment like I have the the, here's the best looking fish room on YouTube or that kind of thing because there was a lot of effort put into making that place look nice. So I very much enjoy it. But um, yeah, I think it's just making little little changes here and there for me to enjoy it more, spend more time. Um, when I notice that I spend time in the fish room and I have my tanks clean, then I really enjoy them. So as an example, I did some water changes a couple days ago down there. I cleaned some algae. I moved some fish around. And then I was down there earlier this morning. I'm like, man, like my tanks are looking good. Like I'm really enjoying this. And uh um, so that I, I'm just going to keep doing that, just making sure that whatever I'm doing down there is for fun, it's for things that I enjoy. Don't do it for YouTube or for what people think I should keep. Um, and just remembering why I have a fish room in the first place and why why I am so involved in the hobby and what brought me to the hobby and just focus on that. No, that's awesome. And I, I like to go back um, how you're talking about the tanks that you see at eye level. It's very much in line with kind of supermarket product placement, right? Mm -hmm. Like you want the things that you like really want to move that you really want to sell. Now, granted, I know a classic example is a cereal, sugary cereal at kid eye level. But I think that does translate though to exactly what you're talking about. Like the things that you can see um, in myself running a small fish room where I had things on three different tiers, I know that the tanks that were the the mid-level, those I even like strategically put my discus at those mid-level tanks, right? Like I put the mm -hmm. things that I wanted to pay the most attention to at that level. Um, and, you know, having run the fish room for a number of years, like the lessons learned and what I would do in my next setup, um, less is more, I think is definitely kind of a principle of, you know, Randy's fish room 2.0. Um, yeah. But then also, you know, not doing the... And I'm, I'm almost positive Joe Ferdenzi told me this as well, like doing the low tanks at the, you know, just trying to maximize the space, right? Like mm -hmm. now I, I, I realize that some people are going to set up a fish room because they are entering into that business space where they want to breed. They want to have many fish. They need to have a lot of grow out tanks. I'm not talking for those people that are going to run a fish room. I'm talking for like the you and me that are hobbyists that want to make sure that they don't burn out or, you know, I, I realize that this, this advice, like a lot of it is people just have to go through their own experience. Right. But yeah. from my experience, um, having it at one level, less is more, not trying to maximize every single, uh, space that I have, even my conversation with Corey about my Corey equis that I think that having the 20 high being front to back on the rack instead of normal mm -hmm. left to right, I think that mm -hmm. played a factor into them not breeding for me to be perfectly yeah. honest. Now, somebody might be screaming at their car, you know, listening to this podcast and say, no, Randy, you're just a bad fish breeder. Possibly. <laughs> That's you, you might not be wrong, but I don't think that the orientation of the tank, especially with two painted sides to it, making it like a long cave, I don't mm -hmm. think that helped. Um, so, you know, in my head, and I love Corey's husky tables that he uses uh, for the 40 breeders, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I want to go with, right? Where they're, you know, at a nice, um, maybe not exactly eye level, but eye level from sitting down probably. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, you're just hanging out on like a rolly chair or you're sitting in a, in a comfortable chair and you're just at eye level with the tanks, you know, again, that 640 breeder setup at eye level just really sounds super appealing and forcing myself to not be able to get everything under the sun. Right. Like, yeah. no, like you work with a few select things. Um, I definitely want a Ninja Turtle tank. I need to get some of those mini must turtles from Corey. <laughs> I, heard, I heard that. That's going to be the most amazing thing ever, dude. Those I <laughs> love those turtles. I absolutely yeah, love those they're turtles. They're cool to look out. They're a little messy and, you know, you can't keep a lot of things in them. But if you can keep it under control, yeah. right? And remember, yeah. I have a seven and a five-year-old boy. That is true. That I is have true. two boys. They are going to love yes. those little turtles, man. So, yeah. Yeah. And I love that they grow moss on their shells. So I think uh -huh. that'll be a really, really fun setup. So then I've got basically five tanks of, all right, what's, what's Randy going to work with, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that's 
that's as somebody that is super transient between, you know, fish rooms and only having, you know, a, a 20 long and a 15 high to play with right now. Um, yeah. you know, it's given me a lot of time to pause, reflect and think about what I want to do for my next fish room setup. And I certainly don't regret what I did because everything I did informed, you know, my fish keeping yeah, experience helped, now helped to shape you. Yeah. I, and I did the same thing, especially when I was breeding fish, you know, space was at a maximum. I didn't care what the fish room looked like. It was as many boxes of glass that I could get down there as possible to maximize and have as many fish species as possible and, and multiple tanks of the same species. But now that it's really just more for enjoyment and content and the aesthetic value, um, obviously I have it set up differently. And I would say for anybody that's setting up a fish room now, if you're doing it for breeding purposes, if you're doing it because you're trying to get, you know, breeders points awards at your local fish club and you want to like have multiple species and you're selling fish, totally understand like maximizing space. But if you're doing it just because you're a collector and you want to have a South American tank and an African tank and a planet tank and all these different things, um, less is more. Don't just think about setting up the tanks and that level of work, but think about the amount of work that you're going to have to do on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis. And then if you're like, yeah, like I could easily manage six or eight aquariums and have them all looking nice all the time, then that's that should be your number. But if you're like, yeah, I, I don't think I could do 25 aquariums and have them all look nice and take care of them and be up on my water changes and everything, then maybe don't have 25 tanks. So, Zenzo, have you met Michael Barber from uh, uh, our Peru trips? He's I also he's, no. he's big on the, the the East Coast scene with uh, like the DC area clubs. So Michael Barber, I remember a wonderful guy. I miss Michael. I haven't seen him in a couple of years since our last Peru trip. Um, he and Devin are the masterminds behind the uh, Project Amazonas uh, fish collecting trips that we go on. Which you would have met him a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I missed to that ditch one. Us. <laughs> yeah. There will be there will be Next more. One. Yeah, next for one. sure. No, you absolutely will go on the yeah. next one. I'll be very upset, Zenzo, if you don't come <laughs> along. Um, so I remember he showed me his fish room and his fish room is kind of down in his basement area and it's like a corner of his basement and it's just, you know, like four or five very nice tanks. I think no more mm -hmm. than, I think his biggest one might've been a 40 breeder and Michael, I'm sorry if you happen to be listening to this and I'm misquoting what you have, but, um, the gist is that he is somebody that has spent a lot of time in this hobby that loves fish and he has a very small collection but he also spends a tremendous time actually like in the field working with fish um, and mm -hmm. just loving what he does. So, you know, it's, I, I guess as I mature, which is a very odd thing to associate with myself, um, <laughs> you know, more tanks doesn't mean you're a more better hobbyist, right? Like no, there it are... just means you're busier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, like, it's like, it's like yeah. more, more kids doesn't make you a better parent. It just means you're changing 10 times as many diapers. Yep. Or whatever it is, right? So you could be an amazing parent with one child or two child, two, ch two children or 10, but you're going to be infinitely busier with 10 than you are going to be with two. So Yeah, so maybe that's a message for like n relatively new hobbyists that are on that, like, you know, they're on that the cusp of, 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 you know, getting kicked out of the spare bedroom and they need to go to the basement and fire up a fish room. You know, less sometimes is more. You know, and so so take it from two two dudes that have, you know, had fish rooms and, you know, live and breathe the fish, tropical fish industry uh, mm -hmm. from a content creation and an actual like career. Um, sometimes less is more. But again, like if you want to do it, man, go for it. Go for it. Have that experience. Sure. Kick butt. Breed the fish. Have the things. Love it. Um, but just uh, just our take that's all you know and, and hopefully you appreciate that and you know you don't hear this as me being like don't do a fish room you're not gonna <laughs> enjoy it like no uh, yeah i think i think if if someone has the space and a time i highly recommend if you're if you're really into the hobby trying it out one time and you may love it and you may be super like success successful with it um but you'll never know if you don't try and uh, just just know that uh you know, no one's going to think less of you if you decide down the road that, you know, keeping 50 aquariums wasn't for you and you really need to take care of five or 10. Like, that's you know, fine. One pro of the bottom row of uh, of a fish tank that's, you know, maybe let's say the, the bottom of the tank is nine or 10 inches off the ground, right? So very low to mm -hmm. the ground. One pro is that, um, and I'm going to have these memories forever my boys being like three and one coming in the fish room and just posting up 
and staring at the 40 breeder that had the million angelfish fry that I never took to the mm-hmm. co-op for a very, very long time. But right. that was a mesmerizing tank. Those boys love that tank. And right next to it was the super red breeding 40 breeder. They, I didn't have to lift them up. They didn't have to go on the little step stool. They could just sit there and look at it. So inadvertently, you know, I've got, those are actually like, and them hatching out fry with me or a uh, uh, baby brine shrimp. You know, those are going to be some of the best memories that I have out of that fish room are my mm-hmm. little goofballs, you know, being able to just sit there and look at the fish on their own, you know, and not have to have me hold them or, you know, I could just do whatever in the fish room, whatever maintenance I needed to right. do. And they're just sitting there mesmerized by the angelfish going to town. Mm-hmm. So African cichlid. So I've played with some species. I've played with uh, some frontosas back when I lived in Sacramento way back in the day. Um, you know, just had those more for a display tank. Um, in my fish room, I was able to get the uh, yellow labs to breed, which I don't think is much of an accomplishment. I think those are just kind of feed them and they'll breed. But that was cool. Um, mm-hmm. I had some trophies. You know, those trophies were super skittish. Um, you know, and that's kind of another part of the fish room is I had so many different species. I wasn't able to really probably give the trophies enough attention that they deserved. Um, but I've dabbled a little bit with some African cichlids. I've done multis, the multi, uh, multi, oh man. Neolampelagus multifasciatus. Yes. Thank you. Uh Thank you. Uh, So I played with those and those ended up at the coop, bred those guys. That was a lot of fun. I want to do a little bit of a breeding deep dive, Zenzo. Give me a species that you really enjoyed working with and kind of walk me through um, what your setup was like and just your experience in general with, you know, said species. Well, so when I was breeding fish for profit, I was do, I was, well, I didn't do it the right way. So first <laughs> off, I, I didn't choose the right fish. I ch- the fish chose me. So if someone's going to really breed for profit, you need to do a whole lot of research into the market, what sells, what's going to be easy to raise and feed. I'm going to put that on a pillow, by the way. I'm sorry how, to interrupt how, you, but I didn't choose the fish. The fish chose me. There you go. Zenzo Tazawa. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I, I actually gave a presentation at the uh, at the Pacific Coast Cichlid Association recently, and I, and I talked about breeding fish and how to choose how to breed fish and and, and what to avoid and all that kind of stuff. But basically, um, when I was breeding fish, I chose the wrong fish. I I started breeding African cichlids originally by accident, right? So um, you have African cichlids. If you don't have all males, you're going to end up with females holding. And you're like, oh, I want to save them. So you put them in a tank, then they spit the fry, and then you've got a bunch more fish and so on and so forth. So um, it kind of started off with me like doing it uh just inadvertently and talking to some fish stores like yeah like we'll buy them from you at this you know wholesale price basically so i converted my fish room to like i i bought like these 55 gallon home depot plastic totes and made like mini ponds out of them and built like two by four bracing so they wouldn't bow out and use like um like corrugated plastic as lids and that kind of thing and and so Basically, I started growing and, and, and raising African cichlid fry and selling those to the local fish store um, once they got to adult size. And I really enjoyed it. Um, and I was focused on a lot of cara, so peacocks, um, not in Buna like your yellow labs, um, mainly because they, they, the colors were very vib- vibrant. And when I had a bunch of males that were super colorful, I could take them to the fish store and they would look great and they would want to buy them and sell them. Um, the other fish that uh, so I did that for a while until I realized like yeah like there's there's no money in this I'm spending more money than I'm making money on a lanacara because they're you know you make a million of them and you can only sell them for two fifty a piece or whatever and it takes you five months to get them big enough to sell so um, it wasn't really worth the squeeze at that point um, what was worth the squeeze where I live was shell dwellers so the multifasciatus that you were talking about shellies or multis um, they're small. They don't take up a lot of space. They don't take a lot of care as far as like setting up tanks to um, get them to spawn. And um, they're very easy to catch if you have them in PVC elbows. And in the San Francisco market, and this might be true for a lot of areas where space is at a premium, people like small fish because they don't need big tanks. You can have a wonderful shell dweller colony in a 20 long 
and you'll have all the space that you need versus, you know, a lot of car, you're going to want a 75 or larger. So um, San Francisco, obviously, a lot of people live in, you know, apartments and homes that don't have, you know, giant basements and that kind of thing. So uh, the shell dwellers were a hit. And um, those I would also sell at a much higher rate than I would the Ilana Cara. So, you know, I could sell a shell dweller all day long for, you know, $10, $10 $12 a piece. And it was a fraction of the of the lifting for me as far as the work involved and, and caring for them and feeding them. And uh, so that that was a, a very enjoyable fish to breed. And I still have two different tanks with them and, and uh, I'm not selling them now, but they're just, you know, spawning all over the place and they're wonderful. I love them. The, the, so I kind of want to unpack some, some differences between like Alana Cara and Mabuna. Um, were you hands-on with the, once the, once the female is holding the fry in her mouth or I, I, cause I assume they're mouth brooding, right? Yeah. They're mouth yeah. brooding. Are you are you doing are you letting nature take its course and letting the fry just kind of naturally develop or were you separate? I forgot the term. I'm pretty sure Rick from um, Florida Fish Farm. I'm pretty sure he told me the term. What is the term? Is it when you separate when spit? uh, spitting? Uh, yeah, but you, you're yeah. manually getting them to spit, right? You're you're doing the separation. I've, I've done both. I've done both. I've I've used like um like uh, breeders where um you would basically uh, get the female holding eggs. You would have her uh, spit the eggs into a container, like a specimen container, and then you would put those in a in a like a breeding bubbler and hatch the fry that way. I've done it that way, but I've always found it to be way easier to pull the female from the tank. I remember at one time I had a 40 breeder with like six or seven females, and I put and I would put a male in there, and I would say, okay, I want to breed this male. I put the male in there, and um, when the females hold. I would remove that female from the tank and I would place her in a separate 10 gallon tank by herself. Now you might think 10 gallon tank for an Alana Cara is too small. All she's doing is just hanging out. She's not, she's not eating because she's holding. So basically she just needs a, a safe place to not be hassled and, and to just kind of hang out until the fryer free swimming. So I would put the female in the tank, let her um, spit naturally and then once she would spit naturally, I would remove that female. I would put her in another tank by herself, let her fatten up and eat alone for a week or two so she wasn't getting hassled to spawn right away again. And then I would grow out the fry in that 10 gallon until they got larger. Then I would transfer them to larger tanks. Um, and I found that to be easier. Sometimes you would find a female holding and she wasn't, the, the fish weren't like, free swimming at the, the fry weren't free swimming she wasn't spitting them and so what i would do is i would uh, catch the female and basically hold her gently in my hand i would take a paper clip like the rounded part of the paper clip so not an open paper clip but it's a normal paper clip in its in its normal form and uh, you just gently like uh, rotate that paper clip in her mouth and if her mouth is underwater all the fish will swim out and and uh, basically just make sure that they're all, you know, out of her mouth. And then I would then put her in another tank and let her, you know, eat again. And then I would just put those those fry into a tank. So did, did um, you ever have experience with females predating? Like they spit, we got free swimming fry and you went a day or two too long and the female crushed all the fry. I have not experienced that. Um, I and I don't know if it was luck or just having good females that didn't do that um, or being well fed enough in advance of, cause yeah. So the females are eating for like three or four weeks while they're mm -hmm. holding. Um, so they are, so they are hungry. Um, but I al always had very healthy fattened up uh, females beforehand. So um, they probably were fine and had plenty in reserves and weren't like starving to eat their fry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, good moms. Yeah, and, and just trying to equate again kind of the experience with how my fish room was set up when I was running, when I had the uh, the labs that ended up spawning and, you know, that little colony, um, that mm -hmm. was in a 20 long on the top of a gladiator. So that in mm -hmm. order to service and to access that tank, I'm standing up on a very high step stool. That's adding a level of complication and, yes. you know, making it that much harder to catch the fish out and just kind of, you know, I guess circling back to kind of talk about again, you know, how you have your fish room set up, you know, while sure you can have the fish, it, you know, kind of adds when you need to get into that tank, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, but yeah, you've at least got the tank. 
Yeah, getting into tanks, uh, if you are breeding, you definitely want to be able to access all corners of the tank. Um, what I found is for catching fish, lower was easier as you're not having to like, you know, stand up and reach into a tank. You could basically just reach down. So the lower level tanks when I was breeding was, were very easy. And obviously the ones that were, you know, staged on the floor were very easy. Um, uh, and then going back to the Africans, to the Malawis, I'm still breeding. Um, so actually I purposely kept a handful of females in my display tank downstairs and I have some fish that are super old. I have fish that I've had since 2016 and they're like grandfather fish. They look oh, terrible. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They look, they look They're not awful. meant to live that long. They're not yeah, meant to live. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, some are from 2016, some are from 2018 and I've had some pass and I've documented it all on YouTube and talked about old fish and that kind of thing. Um, and so to replace those, I'm like, yeah, well, I'm not going to buy more fish. I'm just going to let them. I, so I basically did the same thing. I took, found a female holding, put her in a tank, let her spit, and I have two tanks right now with fry uh, growing out, which I think I'm going to end up putting all of those in my display tank in the living room, letting them grow out there, and then I'll just catch a few and replenish my tank downstairs. So what what uh, what species are those fish? They're random. So I mm. I didn't uh, I didn't like uh, they're probably going to all throw ob. And, and various mm -hmm. forms. So um, it was just a display tank with like auto pharynx lithobates and OBs and red shoulders and that kind of stuff. So they're just all random Alanacara. Um, and they'll, some will be blue, some will be blue with yellow, some will be OB. And uh, yeah. What, is, I, what, I, is, I, what does OB stand for again? OB stands for orange blotch, but they're mm. not always orange. Um, but basically, it's when you have, uh, I don't want to call them hybrids because they're it's coloration. It's not like a different type of genus or anything, but basically it's... Yeah, it's like a blue-orange calico kind of mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. a calico, so it, it could just have like different, you know, different throw, throw different colors. And, you know, some people hate them. Some people feel, or you know, there's there's a faction of people that believe in, uh, you know, line breeding and not mixing mm -hmm. them up. And I and I totally understand, that, especially if, if you like wild caught fish. But look, all my fish that I have were in Africans are were from a farm, you know, and grown in Florida or Asia or somewhere, and you know they're not pure from Lake Malawi anyway. So I love. Um, I just want to enjoy. Love... I love wild fish, but I also like things like flower horns. So, you know, I'm not exactly the best person to, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and then there are fish that I, you know, obviously are, are not hybridized that I have like my shell dwellers and things like mm -hmm. that. And so, um, so yeah. then in your experience with shell dwellers, so for, for me, shell dwellers was just set in, forget it, Ronco showtime. Like I do nothing but just plop down some PVC elbows and a bunch of crushed coral and they were good to go. So were you doing any, mm -hmm. Um, separating of, I guess, when you knew you had fry, did you pull the PVC to let the fry grow out in their own tank? Or no. you just let them grow as a colony? They let them grow as a colony. Uh, shell dwellers, most of them are really good parents. I have had some problems with gold ocelotus lately um, to where they're, because they're pretty hyper aggressive. Um, and so I, I find that not all the fry survive. So I have like a, I have a 40 gallon tank right now with gold ocelotus. And usually, like only two or three fry survive from mm. a couple of batches of fry, um, but you know it's just it is what it is. I'm not trying to you know raise those out, but um, with the multis, uh, they're not as aggressive. They're really good parents, and um, I have not experienced predation or anything like that. And uh, yeah, yeah no, the colonies they, they, just they explode. Breed like, yeah, they breed yeah. like cockroaches. I don't think there's yeah. any. I don't think there's any predation going on in that. If anything, they're yeah. like, no, you're disgusting. I'm not, I'm not eating you. Right. You're yes, nasty. I, I leave them be. And then, um, and then, uh, you know, once they get to a certain size, you just, you'll either catch them with a net or you take out the elbows and pop off the cap and they swim right out. So um, if you're using shells, it's exceptionally difficult. So um, I would use shells only for display, not for uh, trying to breed and, and catch them out. So I have a, I have a fun experience with those shells. Um, so 
my wife and I, we get to do like a couple's dinner, like once a year when, uh, her parents come into town to watch the boys, right? Like we don't, we don't do a lot of couples dinners together, uh, or just her and I. So we go to a couple towns over, there's a, you know, local restaurant, fair, not, not high end, but it's like a French restaurant with good food. So we go there and we're doing like a four thirty, five o'clock, um, dinner. And, uh, one of the things we got was escargot, right? Like haven't mm-hmm. had that in, I don't know, 10 years. Sure. We'll try your escargot. I like to eat. Um, so the server brings it out and sure enough, the shells, and I know this from like Dean and just being in the <laughs> hobby that they're like the exact same shells that you get from restaurant supply places. And, yes. um, and I asked him, I'm like, Hey, I'm pretty sure that like those shells, like they're, you guys get that from restaurant supply. That's not actually the snail species that we're going to eat, right? Because that, that, that's more what I was curious about. I was actually curious to connect the dots on, are the shells of the same species of snail that you actually eat when you have escargot? And so he didn't know that. And he goes back and asks the, 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 the cook because he thought that he's like, no, 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 those are, those are the shells of the snail you're about to eat, my friend. He comes back and he's like, no, like, yeah, you're right. Those are different. They, we just get these empty and we put snail in it and cook it. And, you know, it was, it was good. Um, he's like, how did you know that? And so I go down the rabbit hole and I tell him, let me tell you about, uh, let me tell you about shell dwellers, my friend. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I tell him like, this is one of the things that, you know, as hobbyists, we go to restaurant supply places, we buy them on Amazon and, um, you know, you, you, because this fish dwells in, um, snail shells that fall down to the bottom of the lake and that's what they use for their homes. But it's actually really tricky because you can't get them out easily. Like they'll stay in there like they're stuck with super glue. So what we do, you know, what some genius, you know, years ago developed was just take PVC elbows that have, um, you know, a cap on the end and then you just remove the cap. It replicates a, a, a suitable snail shell and they're cool with it. They'll breed in it, but you can easily access it. So that was kind of really fun. We're like hobby met real life. Um, mm-hmm. And I was and, and the dude was like super impressed. He's like, you know, asked me about what I do. I told him about aquarium co-op and I'm like, well, you know, I'm kind of a nerd and you know, so we, we kind of had that fun little conversation. Yeah. So yeah, order escargot yeah. and then impress your server with that knowledge. I, I believe, um, well, you know, obviously working in the food industry in the past that, uh, the majority of escargot meat is coming canned. And then they're adding it to the recipe, adding garlic and all the stuff that they do, cook it up, and then they're putting them in the shells as a uh, presentation. Yeah. But I, I yeah. wouldn't be surprised, though, if that canned snail, though, is probably of a different species of snail than the actual shell. Quite like possibly. We, yeah, sure. like we probably found like, oh, this snail is disgusting, but it's got a beautiful, hard, awesome shell that we can just reuse over and over again. But the meat snail, though, maybe it's got like a, you know, a, a, a lame shell that's super, you know, it cracks all the time. It's very thin and it's not robust and it's not meant for, you know, I, I, I don't want to say like mass production, but, you know, at scale of what global S cargo consumption is. Right. Man, that's just going to be like the title of this episode. Randy and Zenzo <laughs> on S cargo. <laughs> well, I, I think the other thing is that like, you know, snails is food. It's eaten in a lot of different areas. So, you know, what you eat in, let's say, France is going to be different than what you eat in, you know, the Mediterranean area or Asia. So there's different snails. And so I think it's, yeah, I think they just picked the right one that uh, had the best shell for presentation. And then the meat might be various types. Mm-hmm. But I digress. I don't know. I, I've only had it once and I didn't enjoy it. So well, I, and, it I was, know, and it wasn't I, in France. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have a tab open right now. So once you and I are done, I'm going down this rabbit hole, and I'm okay. <laughs> I'm going to find out what species of of, of I want to know the species for the shell, and I want to know the species of the meat because there I'm you just, go. I'm just far too. I'm actually going to be a little disappointed if it's both the same. Like I want it, <laughs> I want it to be different so bad because then my whole spiel on like selecting the best shell and selecting the best meat like actually comes to fruition (laughs) like it's actually how it works out so i don't want to be disappointed or or it might be a situation where it is the same species and you know obviously they're farm raised so they're you know probably thousands and thousands of snails and in a particular pen or farm but they found that yeah the best way to harvest them is for us to remove the meat from the shells process it um you know pasteurize it or whatever they do can it 
And then these shells, like we still need these for presentation. So we clean them, bake them, whatever. And then we sell the shells in a bag and we'll actually make more money because we're selling the shells and then we're selling the, selling the, the snail meat as a separate item. And it's easier to handle. It's safe. We're not, we're not handling a whole snail in a shell. It's clean. So don't mm -hmm. be disappointed if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so this reminds me of like, one, I'm hungry now. Um, but two, um, a couple years ago, I had read the article about and watched a, watched a, a video on it. Um, the glass eels, the ones from Maine. Are you familiar with these? I don't believe so. So, so I'm, I'm going to butcher this. And there's one person that's going to know. Uh, maybe it's Captain Duckweed who lives in Maine. He probably knows. Um, basically, I think it is a... Um, I think they're like salmon where part of the time they're in salt water and then part of the time they're in fresh water. Probably going to okay. butcher this. But they come into like these ma these rivers in Maine, the state of Maine. Um, yep. And that's where they spawn. And then they have their like their, you know, larva, fry, juveniles. But we catch them and they're like worth more than gold because they go to Japan. And then in Japan, they raise them up and then they get turned into like really high end. I don't want to say that's the eel used for unagi, but it gets turned into a very high end eel food. Huh. Um, and there's a whole industry on trying to be more sustainable with raising these. And it felt very like Aquarius podcast adjacent where I'm super curious on their breeding setup. Like, what are they doing? Maybe they're hatching baby brine shrimp. Maybe Artemia is one of the initial food sources for these eels. But um, it's a limited, very, very limited resource. I think Maine really controls like the permitting for who can go out and actually collect the eels. I mm -hmm. want to say there's like a shady black market of like sturgeon in California where people go out and poach it kind of the same idea going on here but if you can get those things to japan they will they will pay top dollar really fascinating and i want to maybe I, maybe i still will follow up with somebody um and have them come on and kind of talk about that but that just seemed because you know again we're talking about like aquaculture we're talking about breeding um and you know dean is like i think dean's a fantastic example of like if if there was a company that was like, man, I want to like do aquaculture tilapia, bring Dean in, like just, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, he's one of those guys. And there's probably deans in the actual industry of aquaculture that just know how to set things up to get fish to breed, to, to be able to successfully raise fry at various stages. Um, but they're just doing it on a commercial scale for food where we're, again, we're doing it at a hobbyist level for hobby enjoyment. Yeah. I think it depends on what kind of fish you're going to breed for aquaculture. Because if you did something like tilapia, which are relatively easy, um, I think any of us could do that quite successfully. And I've actually seen some backyard tilapia farms in Hawaii where they basically are just keeping fish like we would keep fish or keeping them in outside ponds and you can grab one and eat it. Like, wasn't that was that you and I Zenzo were talking about how both of us want to do a hydroponic aquaculture setup one day? But yeah, you kind of, I mean, you kind of already do, right? Yeah, I, I did at one point. I, I, there's nothing. There's no vegetables in there right but now. But you had nothing but... to eat, though. You didn't have the aquaculture part of it. You were. Oh, using... I didn't eat the fish. Okay, because they were your yeah. koi. They were your like your koi or yeah, your goldfish. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I was uh, growing strawberries and lettuce and stuff like that from the uh, in a little hydroponic soil bed above the above the pond that was fed by the pond water awesome yeah i i'm, I'm also again like guest idea maybe even the co-op youtube uh members club you we haven't had anybody come on and talk about like aquaculture meets hydroponics have we no we haven't that feels yeah like and but getting it at the scale of a home hobby it's like hey man you you live in suburbia you've got a little backyard or even maybe on a smaller scale like you know what is the smallest scale of like actual consumable <laughs> i realize that this is taking a weird turn but like what is the fish that you could actually like you know i think it's tilapia off, yeah, is it tilapia that's going to be the smallest yeah. that's going to be, again, juice worth the squeeze? Because there's some fish. I remember in Portugal, we were catching fish out of the ocean that were like tiny little like reef fish, and they throw those things in whole and fry them up, and you just eat it like it's french fries. Yeah, I think tilapia, because you don't need a whole lot. I mean, you could do like, if you had uh, like a 300-gallon stock tank or something like that, like you could easily grow some tilapia in there. And um, you could use the, you know, the water and have some kind of, you know, filtration system that, you know, grew some plants 
And because they're basically like cichlids, right? You can just treat them like any cichlid and you could separate the, the fry and the whole thing. And um, like, like in Hawaii, the, the, the tilapia are invasive and they're not from there. And you see, you find them in these little small bodies of fresh water and they're just like all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's something magical too about like plant roots in a coarse rocky volcanic medium with just the water passing by their roots like the mm-hmm. plants are just able to pull the nutrients from the water like that there's something about like it makes sense for aquarium like aquatic plants but there's something about a terrestrial plant that doesn't actually need soil like it doesn't actually need to be encased in earth to right. be able to pull nutrients from like that's just magical like you just yeah. go to home depot man i dude i'm so fired up to do this like i'm i, I, I actually I'm... have that on my koi pond is i have a giant home depot plant uh-huh and i don't know the name of the plant but it's some kind of like landscaping plant and it's just in it's just planted in aquascaping soil like that's that's you know like the ceramic beads or like the volcanic bead things yeah and um obviously it has it it grows so fast the root structure is insane and there are essentially no nitrate in the water because it draws it so quickly and um I, i so i just trimmed it recently my plant I trimmed it with a chainsaw. That's how I trimmed the plant because it was just so overgrown and fast growing. I'm like, I am not going to be able to like cut these with shears. I'm going to be out forever. I just grabbed the chainsaw, just cut it all, cut it back like a shrub. That, that sounds like there's your short form content right there, Zenzo. <laughs> There's a there's a 20 second little YouTube short that you could upload you of go. you yes. going to town on your uh, your hydroponic setup with a chainsaw. I would like you to say, can you send me a, a video or a picture when we get done with this? Because I would love to see. Um, I want to see your setup and the plant that you're talking about. Uh, yeah. How did the how did the strawberries do? And how did they taste? Yeah, strawberries are fine. Uh, it's just one of those things where, you know, it's you don't get enough to make it worthwhile. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, so like, ah, yeah, I grew some strawberries and like we had a bowl full. I was like, all right, well that was, that was it. <laughs> you got it. Right? You needed it. You needed it scale. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you get like a bowl full of strawberries. You probably, I probably had enough lettuce for like two or three bowls of salad. Um, I'm trying to think what else I did. Green onions. That was, you know, you just kind of trim them and keep eating those mint, but mint is just like a weed. So it gets out of mm-hmm. control, but had tons of that. Can't even get rid of that. Did the, um, did the strawberries at least taste better? Oh, they, did they, did they, I don't did know they, they taste, taste better than the, did like, they taste store? fishy? Did they taste? No, no, yeah. no, no, nothing. Obviously, <laughs> I'm joking. Obviously I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. They, they were good. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, uh, so, I mean, but yeah. you saved yourself at least one trip to Costco though. You got your one big plastic clamshell of strawberries. You got that little multi-pack of lettuce. That's a Costco trip. You save yourself. Good on you. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just trying to make some lemonade. Sure. Man. When la- hey, you, you, you give me some lemons, I'm making lemonade. Yeah. That sounds cool yeah. though, man. I like that. And, um, yeah. So, so then just the next move, do you see yourself? Like if you, if you had the backyard space, would you scale it up? Uh, no, I, 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 I wouldn't not, not, not living where I live. If I live somewhere tropical, yes, because it would be easy because of, you know, weather and and everything is like, if if I could rely on rainfall to help fill a pond and amazing temperatures to grow tilapia and, uh, you know, if I had, if I had an acre in Hawaii, sure, I would probably do a tilapia pond and grow a bunch of vegetables and tomatoes and things like that. But, um, other than that, I, I I don't see myself, it's just a lot easier to go to the grocery store and (laughs) right. Just, (laughs) just get your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, there definitely is a convenience factor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Zenzo, we are approaching the one hour mark, my friend, and I know you've got a hard stop coming up. So I want to thank you for coming on for your third time on the Aquarius podcast in six years. So we got to where our, our average of having you on isn't the best, but um, yeah, thank you, good. Zenzo. It was a, yeah, it was a great conversation. I hope people, uh, I hope people enjoyed it. And um, I think it'd be awesome if everybody just went and got escargot and then just blew away their, <laughs> blew away their server with their nerdy knowledge of uh, of where those snail shells are actually coming from. Right, right. Well, thanks for having me on. It was a blast, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll uh, get a chance to do this again in the future.